In our last OI podcast, Professor Theo Vandenhout joined us for a discussion on an ancient plague that ravaged the Hittite kingdom. The ancient Hittites believed the plague originated in Egypt. Today, Theo joins us for a discussion on the political landscape between the Hittites and the Egyptians that gave rise to this belief. Well, so they were two of the major powers uh, in the ancient Middle East who at some point established treaty relations. The Hittites were always very eager to establish written down relations with another power, uh, not to attack each other, to protect each other uh, in times of need and so forth. So that's what they did with the Egyptians as well. But it went kind of wrong in the 14th century and early 13th century BC. In Egypt, at the beginning of the 14th century, we had this pharaoh Akhenaten, who established this, I guess, first kind of recorded monotheistic cult of the, of the, of the sun god, and King Tut is one of his direct successors. When King Tut died around 1323, 24 or so, his widow, uh, and as you know, King Tut died very young. I think he was 18 or 19 when he died. His wife was also very young. So when she became a widow, she felt threatened by the rivaling religious faction who wanted to do away with this monotheistic cult in Egypt, who wanted to restore the old former religion, religious system again. And so in order to try to maintain the, uh, the monotheistic cult, she probably was afraid to marry anybody from the elite. And so she was thinking of an outside candidate. And at that point in time, so late 14th century, the Hittites were probably... Um, well, yeah, maybe at the height of their power. And maybe the other biggest power uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And so she then wrote a letter to King Shupiluliuma, who was then the Hittite king. He happened to be in Syria. He was laying siege to uh, an important city. And suddenly there, this embassy from Egypt came in, probably very colorful, and, 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 uh, and of course not one person, they came with a whole retinue, an ambassador, and they presented a letter to Shupululiuma. You must imagine him there sitting in his tent. In the distance we see the tell of the city that he is uh, laying siege to. His soldiers are eagerly waiting the moment they can burst in and plunder, get their pay. Uh, and then suddenly this, these Egyptians come in and they present a letter from the Queen of Egypt. Let me quote the portion that we have from the letter that she actually sent. She says, I have become a widow. Now let our two great countries become one. You will have them bring me your gifts and I will rejoice about them. And likewise, I will have them bring my gifts to you and you will rejoice about those. And I will rejoice when I send you gifts through my envoys and you will rejoice when you send me gifts through your envoys. It's one big happy world. It's very idyllic. Now, she hasn't asked anything. Uh, Morshili, in a text where he's writing a biography of his father, he, he gives his own summary of her letter, and that is much more businesslike and to the point. He quotes the queen as saying, my husband has died and I don't have a son, but people tell me that you have many sons. So if you give me one son of yours, he may become my husband because I don't want to pick a subject of mine and make him my husband. So the queen, according to Morshili, was apart from the more flowery diplomatic language that we have in her letter, she was very direct and, and she was well informed. Indeed, we know of at least five sons of King Shukululiuma and she says, give me one and he will become my husband. It's interesting that she doesn't say in Morshili's summary that he will become Pharaoh in Egypt, but that will come. Well, you can, Imagine Shupululiuma's surprise. 
they have this sort of peaceful coexistence with Egypt, regulated by a treaty. However, he just had his soldiers invade Egyptian-controlled territory in Syria. So he knew in the back of his head that he was guilty. So he says, or Morsley tells us, and I quote again, when my father heard that message from the queen, he summoned his closest advisors and he said, wow, such a thing has never ever before happened in my life. So thereupon he sent his chamberlain, Khatush Adzidi, to Egypt saying, go and bring me back a reliable report. Perhaps they're setting a trap for me. Perhaps they do have a son of their Lord. So bring me back a reliable report. So he, he's very surprised, but as I guess any king in those days will do, he doesn't say, okay, and <laughs> sends a son. No, he says, okay, let's check out the situation first. So he sends one of his closest advisors. He will go back with the Egyptians to Egypt, check out the situation, and then report back to Shukriyuma if everything is okay or whether his suspicions are well-founded. Now, of course, in those days, the Hittite king, as I just told, was now in Syria laying siege to, a, to an important city. Before, and this was at the end of the summer, it will take several weeks at least for his chamberlain to reach Egypt. There he has to investigate the local situation, assess it, and then he has to travel back. And this time he will have to travel back all the way to deep into central Anatolia to the Hittite capital. So, and also in between there is the winter. And the winter is a very harsh time for Turkey where you can hardly travel. So the earliest he can come back and he would come back was the next spring. And in that, let's say roughly half a year, or more, a lot can happen. The Chamberlain returns to Shubluyuma, again accompanied by an ambassador from Egypt, and Khatush Azidi, the Chamberlain, says to Shubluyuma, it's okay, it all pans out, and they are indeed, uh, she is a widow, she doesn't have a son, and so if I were you, I would send the prince to, to Egypt. Then Shubluyuma confronts the Egyptian ambassador. We have part of that conversation. Ghani, the uh, Egyptian ambassador, now addresses Shukluluma and he says, my lord, that whole affair of our asking for a son of yours is a humiliation for our country. If we had had a son, do you think that we would have come to another country and kept asking for a lord for ourselves? King Tut, who was our lord, he has died. He had no son, and his spouse, our queen, is without children. So we are asking a son of you, our lord, for kingship in Egypt, and for the woman, our queen, we are asking him as a husband. And what's more, just so you know, we have gone to no other country whatsoever. We have come only here to you. So please, our Lord, give us your son. And this ambassador is a very, well, that's how he became an important ambassador. He's a very smart, clever guy. Maybe you know that in the beginning, he started addressing Shupluyuma as my Lord, which would be normal for him addressing a foreign king. But at the end, he twice says, oh, our Lord, give us your son. He is already sort of anticipating Shuplulyuma's decision, whereby the prince of the Hittites will become the next pharaoh in Egypt, and Shuplulyuma will become our Lord, also for an Egyptian in a way. And maybe that is what pulled, in the end, Shuplulyuma in, pulled him over the threshold, and then indeed he says, okay, I will send my son, and he and there is sort of he makes a solemn occasion out of it, and then he sends his son. The son goes away, probably also with a whole retinue and with lots of gifts and so forth, uh, but the son 
is murdered in when upon arrival in Egypt. And of course, this is a major international diplomatic incident. This is what states go to war for. So, and that's indeed what Shupliuma does. He sends another of his five sons uh, with an army into Egypt, that is again into Egyptian controlled territory in Syria, and he does some raiding just to satisfy their own feelings of, of revenge, and he returns laden with booty and with prisoners of war. And it is among those prisoners of war that this other son brings home uh, after his punitive raid that a plague, an epidemic develops. Mm. And, they br and by bringing these prisoners of war into Anatolia, into Hittite, into the Hittite kingdom, they bring in the plague. And only then you could say is Shupriyuma punished by his gods because Shupriyuma may have counted among the very first victims of the plague, he dies. Also this son who carried out this punitive raid, he dies. And that is how Morshli comes to the throne. As a relative youngster, at least he likes to portray himself as very young when he came to the throne. And he immediately had to deal with all the fallout of a major pandemic. Wow. He must have been incredibly confused by the uh, you know, just by the way that events unfolded, the proposition that Egypt offered seemed too good to be true. They did their research and everything seemed to check out and then he's murdered. We, do we know why he's murdered? Do we, was it a trick? Was it political intrigue? Uh, probably political intrigue. I guess most people think, and I would, think the same, that eventually this rivaling faction in Egypt who wanted to restore the old polytheistic religion that they eventually won out and that they killed off this incoming Hittite prince and they indeed found a new husband for the poor widow and he, this man, I, as he was called uh, by the Egyptians, uh, he came to the throne and became the new pharaoh. And the former polytheistic religion was uh, yeah, re-established. So it's, it may indeed, it looks like as if indeed political intrigue uh, won the day. For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu slash member.